Welcome to the Best of Nutrition Research. My name is Kay Vavrina, and I'm here with my co-chair, Malia Martin. And we are happy to have you at our session this morning. We will be covering a wide variety of topics, anywhere from the microbiome to food insecurity, to early onset lung disease in children with CF, bone mineral density, all sorts of topics. Um, but I'm not going to go on any further. I am going to go ahead and get this party started. I am happy to introduce our very first speaker who has um, come all the way around the world. <laughs> to be with us here today and has lost her voice. So we're going to be very patient with her this morning. Um, Dr. Juliana Bailey has come to us from the Alfred Hospital in uh, Melbourne, Australia. And she is going to speak to us today um, a little bit about food insecurity. And um, it's, uh, Juliana, I can't find the title of your abstract, so I'm gonna let you announce it. <laughs> in your very hoarse, hoarse voice. Guys, be patient with her. <laughs> She's um, struggling <laughs> this morning. <laughs> Julie. Thank you, Kay, for the introduction. As Kay said, I have lost my voice. So this is what I sound like. Thank you for your patience with me. I'm gonna do the best I can with it. Probably gonna say a little less than I intended to so I can make it to the end. Um, and if you have questions, please drop them in your app and Kay and I can relay the answers through Kay. So the title of our abstract is Food Insecurity Screening and Local Food Access, Contributions to Nutritional Outcomes Across CF Programs in the US. And I'm presenting for the CF Foundation Food and Security Research Committee today. I do have one disclosure. I'm a scientific consultant for Anagram Therapeutics. It is completely unrelated to this presentation. So to start with some background, nutrition status is closely linked to CF clinical outcomes. I think we all know this in this room. Historically, people with CF experienced malnutrition and had increased caloric demands for a long time. This was the hallmark of cystic fibrosis. Nutrition status is also tied closely with socioeconomic status. And just to provide a definition of food insecurity, it is the limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate foods with either disrupted eating patterns or reduced food intake. The prevalence of food insecurity in the general population is 12%. And food insecurity can be associated with either malnutrition or obesity in the general population. And it's also been associated with clinical outcomes such as poor glycemic control in people with diabetes. There are a couple of studies that have tried to establish the prevalence in cystic fibrosis. And these studies suggest that it's up to 30%. There's limited evidence of associations though with clinical and nutrition outcomes and food insecurity in our CF population. However, anecdotally, if you're a dietitian that works in a care center or a social worker or anybody else on the care team, you've probably noticed and met some patients that you saw had food insecurity or unmet social needs. So there is this large interest generated in addressing this issue amongst the CF care centers in the US. For that reason, the CF Foundation established a multidisciplinary committee to help address food insecurity in our community. This committee was made up of people with CF and their families, dietitians, social workers, physicians, nurses, researchers, and even respiratory therapists. And then of course, we had our CFF staff. And our previous work demonstrates that food insecurity screening in CF programs is feasible. 
So I also wanted to talk a little bit about food access, which is a piece of food insecurity. This is defined as when individuals do not, or food access is defined as when individuals have enough resources to obtain or produce food. And this plays a crucial role in optimal nutrition intake, as you can imagine. And food access is also an independent risk factor for adverse nutritional outcomes. A measure of food access or a concept that sits within food access is a food desert, which is defined by the USDA as a geographical area in which residents have either restricted or non-existent access to healthy, nutritious food. Residence in a food desert is a correlate of food insecurity and overall food intake in the general population. So with that background, the objective of our study was to assess the contributions of CF program level food insecurity screening and the area level food access to nutritional outcomes amongst people with CF. So for our study design and population, we conducted a cross-sectional analysis of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation patient registry using 2019 data, so the year before COVID. So this included all patients in the CFFPR except pregnant patients and lung transplant recipients. We then linked BMI data from the registry to survey data on food insecurity screening practices that was collected from CF programs in the US and also to a USDA measure of food access that's based on patients' residential zip codes. So the quantitative data for this study came from three sources. We had the CF Foundation patient registry data. This included demographics, including um, we also had nutrition status that we defined as BMI. And I recognize we talk a lot in our field right now about looking beyond the BMI and not having this over-reliance on BMI to measure nutrition status. However, we were looking at the population level and BMI is a good tool for assessing nutrition status on a population level, and it is the only thing collected in the registry. We also assessed food insecurity screening practices through a survey conducted in 2021, and this included questions on how programs were screening for food insecurity prior to the pandemic. We also had a measure of local food access um, with a USDA food atlas measure of living in a food desert called the LILA score, standing for low income, low access. We had a qualitative arm of this work where we conducted patient interviews in order to incorporate patient and family voice into what we were finding. We conducted 26 semi-structured interviews over Zoom or the phone, and we wanted to address participants' lived experience with food insecurity and other unmet social needs to complement the quantitative data that we collected out of the registry and give it a little bit more context in life. We, were, we recruited patients from all across the US um, through the help of CF care centers, and we also had a patient partner who was involved in coding the interviews with us. Interviews were analyzed by inductive thematic analysis. And I'm not going to read you these questions, but I wanted to put a few of the questions from our interview script on the screen. In general, we were asking about patients' experience with food insecurity, skipping meals, um, resources that had helped them, um, their experience with government resources, as well as addressing other unmet social needs. So for our study, our outcome me variable measures were BMI percentile for children less than 20 years of age and raw BMI in kilograms per meter square for adults 20 years older. Our predictor variables included food and security screening practices, um, 
This included screening frequency, how often care centers were asking, the modality of screening, whether they were asking in a written or verbal format, as well as whether or not centers were formally documenting their screening process and results. And then we also measured low income, low access, or LILA scores, which again is a USDA food desert and poverty measure that's based on SIP code data. Our CF patient registry covariates included race, sex, ethnicity, age, health insurance type, genotype, whether or not patients were using CFTR modulators and which ones, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy use as a proxy of pancreatic sufficiency insufficiency, supplemental feeding, including oral, enteral, or parenteral, and whether or not patients had a dietitian consultation. For our statistical analysis, we first assessed bivariate relationships between the predictor variables and our BMI outcomes. We then performed logistic regression for our categorical measures of BMI. Our categories that we broke that into were underweight, normal weight, and we collapsed overweight and obese. We then did ordinary least squares regression for continuous measures of BMI outcomes, and we did analyze adults and children separately. So moving on to our results, this is just a table broken up by pediatric and adult um, for characteristics of our population. For our pediatric sample, we had close to 12,000 data on close to 12,000 participants. And for adults, um, we had close to 15,000 participants for the year of 2019. We had to find underweight for children as a BMI percentile less than the 10th percentile. And this was in line with Australia New Zealand guidelines for CF. And for underweight status in adults, we had used WHO criteria of 18.5 or less. So important things to note from our baseline characteristics were that pediatric patients who were older, male, or had CF-related diabetes were more likely to be underweight. And adults who were younger, black, had public or no insurance, had CF diabetes, or pancreatic insufficient were more likely to be underweight. Underweight patients overall were more likely to use supplemental feeding. We would expect that in our patient cohort. So first moving to our BMI and food and security screening practice outcomes. Here we have a table, again, of pediatric on top, adult on bottom. We assessed <clears throat> frequency of screening, modality of screening, and formal documentation. We had unadjusted models, and then we also had adjusted models that were adjusted for age, sex, race, and ethnicity, genotype, insurance, CFTR modulator use, diabetes status, enzyme use, supplemental feeding, and a dietitian consultation. So in children, we found that screening at every visit versus, I don't think you guys can see my mouse, can you? No. Probably can't see the clicker either. I'm just gonna move on. Anyway, up here in the top right, um, in children, screening for food insecurity at every visit versus less frequent screening was associated with lower odds of being underweight. You can see that this remains significant when the model was adjusted for sociodemographic as well as clinical covariates. Down here, formal documentation of food insecurity screening was associated with decreased odds of being overweight, but was not significant in the adjusted model. In adults, screening, <coughs> excuse me, in adults, screening and writing versus verbal screening was associated with having higher BMI, even after adjusting for these social and clinical covariates. Excuse me. Formal documentation was also associated with increased odds of being underweight but this was not significant in, after the model was adjusted. My apologies. 
So moving on, for BMI outcomes and food access in children, residents in a food desert was associated with a lower mean BMI. If we come to the far right here and look at our logistic regression, and this remained significant, <clears throat> excuse me, once our model was adjusted. In adults, residents in a food desert was associated with twice the odds of being underweight and was significant once our model was adjusted again. Limited food access was also, adjust, was also associated with a lower mean BMI in adults, but this did not remain significant once our model was adjusted. Finally, we assessed unadjusted and adjusted joint models of nutrition status as a function of both predictor variables being program level food insecurity screening as well as area level food access. We found, to summarize this very busy table, we found that screening at every visit versus less frequently in children was associated with 39% lower odds of being underweight even when adjusting for other covariates. Residence in a food desert was associated with both higher odds of being underweight and with significantly lower mean BMI. Among adults, screening in writing was associated with higher odds of being overweight as opposed to screening verbally. And this was also associated with higher mean BMI in the fully adjusted models. We also wanted to present some brief results of our food and security interviews just to highlight the patient voice in this work. We had 26 participants from 22 CF programs across the US. We had 17 adults with CF, nine CF caregivers. Our interview participants were predominantly white and predominantly female. And we had five major themes that emerged. The first theme was that food insecurity is severe and debilitating. Second theme was that it causes, ex there are existential financial constraints associated with having CF that contribute to food insecurity. Existing resources to combat food insecurity are insufficient, was another thing that we heard resoundingly throughout these interviews. We also found that shame and stigma is prevalent in conversations about food insecurity between clinicians and their care teams. We know that it's difficult to talk about poverty and that unmet social needs do carry a stigma. And one of our patient quotes that we chose to highlight here was we had a patient that said, I already, when I go to clinics, I feel very judged. And this was holding them back from talking about more sensitive topics like food insecurity. So I felt that was really important to highlight for the clinicians in the room that this shame and stigma does exist around discussing food insecurity, and it's something to be mindful of with screening practices. Finally, patients felt like food insecurity screening is critical in clinical settings. Many patients had stated throughout these interviews that if they were not asked in clinic, that they probably would not have brought it up. So in conclusion, food insecurity screening and local food access are independently associated with BMI status among people with CF. More frequent screening is associated with less underweight among children, whereas screening in writing versus verbally is associated with higher BMI among adults. Limited food access is associated with higher odds of being underweight in children and adults with CF and additionally with lower BMI among children with CF. And finally, patient perspective showed us that assistance for food insecurity and CF is limited. Screening is inconsistent and stigma around this topic is widespread. A major strength of our study was that this was the first report that examines associations of screening practices and with food access with weight status among adults and children with CF. We did have some limitations. The first of which is that LILA scores were calculated using zip code only. This led to less precise measures. 
This is something that is more precise when you can use a full residential address because there can be some variation in um, income and access even within a zip code. However, the registry does not collect anything beyond patient zip code in their demographic materials. We were also unable to adjust for characteristics of CF programs that participated in our food insecurity screening survey. These characteristics might include the size of the program and performance. And about only half of CF programs in the US responded to our survey on screening. And of course, the screening practices were also self-reported in the survey by care center staff. So moving forward, it's essential that we normalize food insecurity screening and expand food assistance programs for people with CF. Opportunity for policy and advocacy work in partnership with the CF Foundation and people with CF exists around this topic and is very needed. Future work should examine BMI outcomes while accounting for state level variation in medical nutrition policies and resources. And future research should also determine if limited food access and food insecurity screening practices are risk factors for overnutrition in the cohort of people with CF on CFTR modulators. I won't read my acknowledgments to you, but I do want to acknowledge out loud the people with CF and their families who participate in both the patient registry and who participated in our interviews, as well as the CF Care Center staff who works tirelessly to enter the data into the CF Foundation patient registry, looking at UK, and the CF Foundation for giving us access to this data. Gabriella Oates, my mentor and the principal investigator on this work. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think we have any time for questions, but I'm sure that Dr. Bailey will be happy to uh, want to catch her afterwards or email her. I'm sure she'll be happy to take questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Jessica Alvarez from, um, she's an associate professor at Emory University School of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology, Lipids and Metabolism. She will be um, talking about her abstract adiposity is associated with glucose intolerance in adults with CF in the CFTR modulator era. Jessica. Great. That's not it. Sorry, guys. Oh. <coughs> it was really awkward to. There we go. <laughs> I'm just going to pretend I'm Juliana. Um, okay. I uh, thank you so much, Kay and Malia, for the invitation to present. Um, I'm actually presenting on behalf of Pichatorn Bright. Supa Kit Janusant, um, who could not be here today. Um, I am also a scientific consultant for Anagram Therapeutics. Um, however, it is uh, no nothing related to this presentation. So we all know that excess adiposity caused by a variety of reasons, um, and especially adiposity in the abdominal area, the visceral fat area, contributes to insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, and ultimately type 2 diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases in populations without cystic fibrosis. Um, and this occurs through uh, various pathways. Can you see my... No. Uh, it occurs through various pathways, including release of free fatty acids, pro-inflammatory cytokines, adipokines, oxidative stress, and mitochondrial function. In CF, diabetes has historically been associated with undernutrition, yet undernutrition rates have decreased, um, as we can kind of see here in this figure. 
with undernutrition being characterized by this blue line uh, from in, ooh, in the year 2000, um, dropping down to from 15% to 6% in 2020, and that's gone even lower now. Um, so undernutrition rates have decreased and overweight and obesity rates have increased in CF. So that's the yellow line, the yellow circles here. Um, at the same time, CFRD has remained the most common comorbidity in CF with a 40 to 45% prevalence by middle age. A study in our lab actually showed that as, as with the general population, visceral adipose tissue, again, that's fat that's centered uh, around our, our organs, uh, was positively associated with glucose tolerance in people with CF, in adults with CF. And we saw this with fasting glucose levels, we saw it with fasting insulin, and we also saw it with HOMA IR, which is a measure of insulin resistance. Now, the study was done uh, before highly effective modulators were widely, av widely available. The purpose of what I'm presenting today is to investigate the associations between body composition and fat distribution and dynamic measures of glucose intolerance in adults with CF who are predominantly on CFTR modulators. And I say dynamic because it looks at a response to a glucose challenge. It involves not only the liver's ability to maintain the glucose while fasted, um, but also uptake of glucose by muscle and by fat. So here we report preliminary data from an ongoing prospective observational study that we have called the ORBIT study um, with participants for this specific uh, presentation recruited from 2019 to 2022. Um, we had 27 adults with cystic fibrosis. We also had 11 non-CF controls. Major inclusion uh, for, for our ORBIT study, ages 16 and older, although this population is only, eight, this subset is only 18 and older, pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, clinically stable at time of testing, and lung function better than 25%. Major exclusion is a diagnosis of CF-related diabetes, inability to fast overnight, pregnancy, lactation, and chronic oral steroids. We assess body composition with our clinical gold standard, DEXA, as well as fat distribution. So we obtain lean mass index, fat mass index, percent body fat, and visceral adipose tissue. Glucose tolerance outcomes were derived from a multi-sample oral glucose tolerance test where we obtained fasted time. We, we measured uh, insulin and glucose at fasted levels gave them the standard OGTT, and then we drew blood at 10 minutes, 20, 30, 60, 90, and 120 minutes. So our glucose tolerance endpoints included the Matsuda index of insulin sensitivity, um, which, as I mentioned earlier, it takes into account both fasted and post-challenge insulin and glucose values. So it reflects whole body insulin sensitivity. We also looked at insulin resistance by HOMA, which we'd done before, uh, again, which only uses fasted measures of glucose and insulin, and therefore thought to reflect more a hepatic uh, insulin resistance. We also looked at the insulinogenic index, which serves as a surrogate for beta cell function or insulin secretion, um, and also disposition index, which reflects the ability of our beta cells to compensate for insulin resistance. So if you're more insulin resistance, you might secrete more insulin to help compensate. Statistical analyses included group comparisons with non-parametric tests um, and assessment of the relationship between our body composition variables and our glucose tolerance outcomes with Spearman correlations, as well as with multilinear regression analyses adjusting for age and sex. So for some demographics, um, the median age of our participants in our controls was about 29 years old. Uh, we had more males in both groups and the groups were predominantly white. About half of our participants with CF were homozygous for the Delta F5 mutation, and 79% of our participants were taking CFTR modulators. Looking at group comparisons in this specific subset, um, BMI did not differ between our CF participants and our healthy controls. Um, about 32%, it's not written on here, about 32% of our participants with CF were would be classified as overweight with only one person who would be classified um, as having obesity. 
no difference uh, in BMI or any of our other body composition measurements in this group. Um, but I'm going to give a shameless plug here um, to go see Lucia Gonzalez Ramirez for a more in-depth look at body composition in people with CF compared to controls. Shameless plug. Please go see her. It's going to be excellent. Um, Okay, so some of their glucose tolerance results are participants with CF had higher fasting glucose levels than those with healthy controls, that's up here. Um, insulin resistance measures, fasting insulin, Matsuda index, home IR, uh, did not differ between our two groups. And we did find uh, lower insulin secretion and lower disposition index in our people with CF compared to our healthy controls. So the next few slides will only pertain to our participants with cystic fibrosis. And these are the results of our correlations between body composition and glucose tolerance outcomes. We found looking at BMI um, with regression analysis that indicated that BMI was positively associated with insulin resistance as measured by HOMA um, and inversely associated with whole body insulin sensitivity, independent of age and sex. Um, we had similar findings when we looked at just fasting insulin, um, but we didn't find any relationships with fasting glucose, insulinogenic index or insulin or disposition index. That was with BMI. Similarly, we found that total adiposity um, shown here with percent body fat, but also we, we found the similar results with fat mass index. Um, total adiposity was positively associated with HOMA IR, so higher body fat, higher insulin resistance, inversely associated with insulin sensitivity. Um, and we also found a significant relationship between body fat and insulinogenic index. We didn't see any significant relationships with fasting glucose or insulin uh, disposition index. Um, we also ran the analyses stratifying uh, by CFTR modulator use, yes or no, and found similar results in, in both our, those on CFTR modulators and those without. The sample sizes for the, the no's for CFTR modulators, however, was pretty small. And so what about fat distribution? Um, same as our other findings, visceral adiposity was positively associated with insulin resistance and in inversely associated with whole body insulin sensitivity. Um, now, we tried to tease apart uh, visceral fat from total body fat in our models, and it looked like the relationships were mostly driven by total body fat. Um, but there's also a good bit of collinearity between visceral fat and, and total body fat. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. We did not find any significant relationships with our lean mass, uh, our lean mass index, and our glucose tolerance outcomes. So, to give you a summary, um, our preliminary data suggests that total adiposity is associated with fasted and postprandial measures of glucose tolerance in adults with CF in the current CFTR modulator era. Um, upcoming analyses will include more participants, uh, as well as mathematical modeling of insulin sensitivity and secretion. We used equations that we could easily derive arithmetically from an Excel file. Um, so, so we really want to try to do more, more in-depth analysis of secretion and sensitivity. And then future studies are going to look at longitudinal assessments, um, as well as include direct imaging of fat and muscle distribution with MRI. Um, that way we can confirm and expand on these findings. Uh, so in addition to our co-authors, uh, we'd like to thank all of our A to Z Lead Nutrition Lab members, um, the Emory CF adult clinical staff, the Georgia uh, Center for Clinical and Translational Alliance research unit staff, um, and of course, all of our study participants who've just been amazing. Um, and we also think we're super thankful for the support of um, the CF Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And that's it. Okay, we do have some time for questions. So if anyone has any questions for Jessica. Okay. Yes, we do. Let's see. Yeah. How do the fasted and postprandial glucose levels in people with CF compare to people without? 
Our fasted glucose levels were a little bit higher in those with CF. Um, and I, in this analysis, I didn't specifically look at the two hour, but generally we have seen that the two hour glucose levels are also higher in our, our participants with CF compared to adults. Hi, Jessica. I'm Hi. Catherine Cutney from Case Western. Thanks for an awesome talk. I really love your data. It's super interesting. Um, my question is, um, I want to put it the right way. So I'm trying to get a sense of how close the insulin resistance that you're seeing in people with higher BMI with CF, like how likely is it to be clinically significant? Do you have a sense of how that degree of insulin resistance relates to somebody with, for example, type 2 diabetes? No, that's a, a it's a really good um, question and point. We didn't, um, I wonder if I can go back to uh, show compared to um, our healthy adults. We actually didn't show differences between our healthy controls and our healthy controls were really healthy. Um, but the whole sort of looking at it on a continuous basis, we don't know is if insulin resistance goes higher, would we see worse, you know, would we start to see, and this is why we're doing the longitudinal studies, would we start to see more risk for diabetes? Right now, it's just looking at insulin and glucose values. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're off the list. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. I'm excited to introduce Katie McDonald. She is a clinical dietitian and certified specialist in pediatrics. She's been affiliated with Primary Children's Hospital in Salt Lake City and the Primary Children's CF Center. And she's gonna be presenting on eating behaviors and appetite in children with CF aged two to five years, and it's the first study. So. Thank you. And I wasn't going to say this, but I do have to thank my grandson, Alex, for the inspiration for choosing this particular graphic. <laughs> he doesn't have CF, but I get this a lot. And I wanted to add the roasted mushroom polenta with balsamic reduction was delicious. <laughs> um, I'm particularly happy to be here today. Um, the news of my retirement was a little bit overstated. Uh, I have been very fortunate to, to be allowed to stay um, on a very part-time basis at Primary Children's, and it's certainly my pleasure. Um, I am grateful to Wei Chen, who's here, who just got here, um, made a mad dash from the airport, and to all of the first study um, uh, study team, Dr. Farrell and Dr. Anton. So we're, we're very, very pleased uh, to present this. The first study started 10 years ago. And, um, and so the, the last enrollees are just turning six years old in, next month, and that will wrap it up for this phase. Of, um, of the first study. So it's it's been a long time and we're really excited that there will be a lot of good information that will be on its way to you. Um, I want to recognize the first study registered dietitian nutritionist team and also the many parents uh, who participated in this. This was a big commitment and a long time. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. Uh, with this study. The um, first study, Feeding Infants Right from the Start. This um, that I am reporting on is uh, part of the Phase two study. This is a multi-center prospective observational IRB uh, approved study. Uh, children with CF um, who were two to five years old 
and completed phase one of the first study were enrolled 145. And we are looking specifically in this presentation at the eating behaviors and appetite surveys that were uh, completed with the first study intake information at quarterly CF visits. Um, there were 520 of those. Um, the number maybe should have been higher, but we had that COVID thing, you know, in there, um, and, and it kind of knocked the numbers down a little bit. Let's see. So this is just a screenshot of the eating behaviors um, questionnaire that families were asked uh, to fill at each of their quarterly visits. Um, and there are 10 questions here, the first being about average appetite in the past month. Um, the next six questions refer to the um, child eating behavior. And this looked at things like the child takes longer than 20 minutes to finish a meal, would rather drink than eat. The child's a picky eater. The child struggles to eat new foods gags or coughs on multiple foods or has difficulty accepting certain food textures, lumpy foods like cottage cheese or mixed foods like casseroles. So there were 24 points possible. They were scored from zero to four, um, depending on the response. The next three questions were the parent eating behavior concerns. So in these, we ask the parents, do you feel confident that your child gets enough to eat? Do you have to coax your child to get them to take a bite? Um, do you feel frustrated and or anxious when feeding your child? With these, the responses were scored four to zero and 12 points possible. All of you are good with math. I know that you realize that's 36 points possible in total. Okay, um, going back to the eating behaviors, um, and again, we were asking excellent, good, fair, poor. Very few respondents, about 5%, classified their child's usual intake as poor. 73%, most of the participants, said the child's usual appetite was fair or good. And then about 22% said excellent. And so this is just a very simple um, or showing of what it, this looks like. So some, and I think the important thing here is that um, almost 80% of people said, eh, you know, not so great. This figure shows um, by different questions, the percent of parents' responses in endorsing eating behavior concerns for children. And as you can see from this, things like meals lasting 20 minutes or more, um, prefers drinking to eating, were, um, and picky eating and neophobia, fear of new foods. Those were the things where, again, many people, a majority of the parents said, yes, this happens at least sometimes for my child. In terms of the food, um, the cat gags or coughs while eating, the difficulties with textures, this fascia sort of things, um, not as common. The combined child eating behavior score, again, is shown here, the parent and then the uh, the child and parent eating behavior score. Again, there are eating behavior concerns about 70% of the time, um, you know, however you look at this. In terms of looking at the overall eating score, then greater than, we had cutoffs. Greater than 27 was considered to be kind of a high um, high risk situation, 10 to 26 points, um, moderate and less than nine, uh, lower, uh, lower concerns. When you have a higher combined, uh, 
child and parent eating behavior score, they tended to have poorer appetites. So there was an association there. And with a lower combined parent and, eat and child eating behavior, they were less likely to have poor appetites on a usual basis. So, so what, I guess, is the question at that point. When we looked at me, mean BMI Z-score, and this is percent um, for age, then um, we looked at this according to their reported appetite. And this shows the mean BMI Z-scores for, um, for children who had poor appetites. They were lower. And then people who had um, children who had the excellent appetites had a better BMI Z-score. So it seems that if you have a person who had a poor appetite, looking at eating behavior concerns might be a way to go. It might be worth looking at. So the conclusions on this. The eating behavior concerns occur, as I have said a couple of times, to some point in about 70% of survey app of respondents. Children with more eating behavior concerns tend to be pickier eaters and poor appetites. Poor appetite does predict a lower BMI for age Z score. Routine screening for eating behavior concerns and appetites in CF clinic can identify issues and target interventions such as appetite stimulants, um, meds, um, or referral to feeding therapy or child psychology. And improving appetite and eating behaviors does have a potential to impact growth parameters, especially BMI for age. And I would be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you. And I, I guess one question I should get from Wei Chen is, why didn't you put the um, NIH grant funding on there? So I should have. This is an NIH funded grant for the first study. And it was CF uh, Foundation. Yes. Um, I have a question. So I'm, I also am in general peds. Yes. And I find that age is a very picky age in general. Absolutely. Did you have a control or anything to show? Because I know 70% of your CF kiddos have those concerns. Is there any reference point for the general pediatric population to kind of do that comparison between those two to five-year-olds to see if it's a higher incidence in the CF population? I, d I do not have a control group for this. So, you know, as we said, this was with the first study, um, no control group. Okay. But, but an op, you know, certainly an opportunity. Yes. We did that in the walk-in separate tool court, and uh -huh. there was a higher uh, yeah, in the CFs than this. Okay, cool. And that would be what I'd expect. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. And so um, what was being said, for those who couldn't hear, um, let me paraphrase for you. Um, in the Milwaukee Center, there was a control group for children answering these same questions, and the children with CF did uh, demonstrate higher eating behavior concerns. That, yes, thank you. Hi, my name is Amber Shepard. I'm a CF parent, and I am a parent of a picky eater. And I'm curious. Welcome um, to the club. Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious if there's any um, studies pending or on the horizon regarding the impact of certain medications on pickiness um, and the impact of their willingness to eat because of the, the, the way it processes through the body and makes them feel mm -hmm. and how that can impact their eating. Well, um, actually with the first study and one of, one of the limitations that I have with this talk is that the, the, the data that was presented did not separate out children who were on um, appetite stimulants or children who had gastrostomy tube feedings. You know, those things, this was just everybody. Um, but we had presented a couple of years ago, and, um, and again, this was information from the first study, appetite stimulants, 
they work. And so the the other interesting thing was that they are not um, universally applied, mm -hmm. that it varies very much from center to center. And so I think it, it really behooves us to think about, is there an algorithm? If we have these picky eaters, if we have low BMI, are there things that should be put into place? Or maybe even things that may need to be removed if there are certain medications Abs that cause absolutely. that negative absolutely. Thank yes. you so much. Oh, thank you. And thanks for being here. We always love having our parents. Hi, Nick. Hi. Um, so I work out of Milwaukee. Um, I work with Dr. Antos. And yes. so I also cover our pediatric feeding clinic. Um, so I work with a lot of kids with pediatric feeding disorders. Um, and so we see this really interesting age range, like seven, eight, there's a lot of picky eating still, but they kind of grow out of it in a sense. So do we have a plan to look at that long term of any of our first study participants and see, do they grow out of these? How are parental feelings on mm -hmm. feeding attitudes and behaviors? Um, for this phase of the first study, no. Yeah, okay. you know they're 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 kind of close now. Opportunities for the fu for future, I, my chin, I don't know. Um, yes, but my clinical experience matches what you described. That at age seven, eight, nine, ten, that the pickiness for some kids will kind of recede a little bit. Um, not always, but very often. So. So yeah, but another great research opportunity. Mm -hmm. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil Farrell, Wisconsin. Uh, Katie, I really appreciate that presentation. And I have a, a question about yes, um, whether or not the uh, habit of having to take so many pills and doing this with meals is a factor and, and uh, picky eating behavior. I bring this up since it's my experience that uh, kids with CF tend to be given their pills with, at the time of meals. Yes. And it could be a lot of pills, as you know. Absolutely. And I'm wondering if that uh, is a factor, if it's been studied, what's your uh, opinion? Um, my opinion. Okay, we'll start with that. My opinion is yes, absolutely, I agree with you. And particularly, um, you know, we set our infants up where they, they have to take the granules. One of, um, one of the things that I heard from a speech pathologist one time was, how would you feel about eating if you had to swallow a spoonful of gravel before you could have anything? And, and you know, and I've always thought about that, and, and I think that that makes a lot of sense. It makes sense too because they, you know, as the kids get older, maybe in this age group, some of them, many of them were swallowing pills, especially by, you know, three or four, but they kind of fill up easy and, you know, and there's that time factor. Um, they're only interested in eating for so long. So could that, could that be one of the factors that contributes to eat these eating behaviors? I think absolutely. Now, of course, the question always is, well, what are we going to do about it? I don't know. You know, for most of the kids, uh, they they do require the enzymes. This also one of the limitations, this did not separate um, out kids who were on um, or who are pancreatic sufficient versus those who were sufficient. We have a lot of analyses left to do, you know, to look at all of these things. Okay, we had a couple from the app. It says, did you consider looking at GI concerns related to poor appetite versus stimulants or feeding therapy? Um, the answer is yes. Um, if you're familiar with the first study, it's very extensive and all of, you know, many of those things are um, included in there and in the papers that will be presented, yes, yes. It's not separated out in this presentation, but for the first study at large, absolutely. Thank you. And then were neurodiverse children's if presence included or excluded? 
Um, and, you know, I'm just thinking about our clinic in general. They were not specifically excluded. Um, and Wei Chen, what, for neurodiverse children, uh, maybe autism, um, I know that we had uh, several of them in the study, but I don't believe that they were they were either excluded or deliberately included. These were kids, you know, from birth who were in the study. So, you know, at birth generally, you wouldn't know. Your your thoughts? Come on up here. Come on up here, girlfriend. <laughs> you can come up here. Yeah, <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you for um, uh, uh, liking our first study. We do have a lot of data. The question about the, the this um, neural um, disorders, we did, we did not have a specific question in our questionnaire, but we collected all medication data and complications, any um, diseases um, related to um, nutrition and eating. So, and they are in a question of uh, further comments Field. So as you know that um, these um, prospective questionnaires are designed uh, in a way that you have specific questions and then you have some open questions. So we have not gone back to look at that um, writing comments field to separate out those that would have other special health care needs. And uh, certainly that's something we need, will do when we are um, drafting the manuscript um, for this particular eating behavior component of the first study. And I also want to just point out that this um, presentation, this is just the first look of the data. And um, as you can see, we did not even present data up to six years of age, which we want to do it next year. And then, um, so I think at that time, um, we will um, identify all potential conf confounding factors and to do a multiple regression analysis model to see um, if eating behaviors um, are an independent um, factor contributing to their growth um, outcome parameters. Yeah, and I also want to just clarify one thing that we do have actually for Katie's presentation, we have 1500 forms and the 520 forms were just an average of every year between three to four clinic visits. So um, our um, nutrition interval history questionnaires, the return rate, response rate was over 95%. Thank you to all the dietitians and research coordinators that are helping the study. They are mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wei Chen. Anything else? I think we have one more question that got okay. voted up. It says, for the poor appetite kids that had lower BMI Z scores, was it clinically significant? And then did the poor appetite kids meet malnutrition criteria or not meet growth goals per CF standards? That's a lot. That, yeah, that is a lot. Um, remember, th these are averages for big numbers. And so there's a wide range. Um, all of these children were being very carefully followed in excellent CF centers. So did, did they meet uh, criteria for malnutrition? Yes, yeah, some of them did. Um, this also does not separate out, you know, children who received um, further interventions. So those things, and I think that is important. You know, it was an observational study, but all of the children, um, it did not impact their CF nutrition care. All were given the best nutrition care. You know, at these many at these six centers. Um, so, and it does change. You know, all of us clinicians know that. So, um, yes, they, they were all getting no holds barred nutrition. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Okay, thank you. So now I'd like to introduce Kathy Liu. She's a third year medical student at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And today she will present on acid suppression therapy and associations with 
growth, gut microbiome, and early onset lung disease in young children with cystic fibrosis. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kathy. I'm a third year medical student and today I'll be discussing acid suppression therapy and associations with growth, the gut microbiome and early onset lung disease in young children with cystic fibrosis. And these are my disclosures. So the background issue of this study um, is suboptimal growth and nutrition due to pancreatic insufficiency. And part of the current therapy we have for this to help kids grow is to supplement with pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy or PERT. Acid suppression is used in children with CF um, to treat suspected GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease, but it's also used to increase the efficacy of PERT. So we know that acid suppression is used for suspected GERD and to help PERT. But in terms of how much it's used, the latest data shows that around 50% of children with CF are using acid blockers. This is despite a 2021 Cochrane systemic review noting insufficient evidence to support improvements in growth, lung function, or mortality with acid blockers. Furthermore, there are also no established guidelines for acid suppression therapy in the CF population, particularly in young children. So this begs the question, are we helping or harming children by prescribing acid blockers? Previous research has already looked at this question and proposed that acid blockers uh, carry risks such as increased susceptibility to lung disease, malabsorption of nutrients like B12 and iron, and negative alterations to the gut microbiome. On the other hand, uh, there is evidence of benefits to acid suppression therapy, including treating GERD, but also a few studies supporting its use with PERT, which would improve growth. Our study sought to better understand how acid suppression is used in general. We also wanted to evaluate three parameters, namely growth, lung disease, and the gut microbiome, and how they are affected by how much or how little acid suppression is used. So for our study, uh, we used data from a multi-center perspective longitudinal study uh, known as FIRST, which you are all familiar with now. Um, this study was started in 2012 and it included a total of 183 infants from multiple CF centers around the US. Um, these infants were enrolled after a newborn screening at an average age of 1.9 months. Out of the 183, we studied 145 um, up to three years of age, which is a relatively critical period of time for children in terms of their growth. We collected data on acid suppression medications, such as H2 blockers and PPIs, um, growth in terms of Z scores for height, weight, weight for height and BMI, and lung disease using the Seafeld score, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, pancreatic sufficiency or insufficiency was determined by fecal elastase and gut microbiome composition was sequenced with 16S rRNA. So we quantified lung disease using the Seafeld score or the CF early onset lung disease score. Seafeld is a scoring system devised from first data that includes eight characteristic clinical features of CF lung disease. And this table is from um, the article about CFL published in Pediatric Pulmonology last year. It shows the components of the score, including hospitalizations, positive pseudomonas or MRSA cultures, and severity of chronic cough. This score for each child was then further classified into severity categories. And essentially, the higher the score, the more severe the lung disease. In the present study, we use the Seafeld score as a proxy for lung disease to compare lung disease severity between persistent and non-users of acid suppression. So in our cohort, the prevalence of acid suppression in the first three, year three years of life was 
Um, in the chart here, the blue represents those who never use asset suppression. Uh, the red represents persistent users or people who started in infancy and continue to three years of age. And yellow represents occasional users or those who started and then discontinued at 15 to 27 months or went on and off acid blockers. Further breaking down acid suppression use by pancreatic status, acid suppression is much higher among children with pancreatic insufficiency as 60% versus only 26% or 27% of pancreatic sufficient children. Among those who used acid blockers, most are treated with H2 blockers initially and then transitioned to PPI at 62%. 27% use H2 blockers only and 11% use PPIs only. The average acid suppression medication start, started at 2.7 months and continued to three years of age. So with an unclear balance between the benefits and risks of acid suppression in mind still, one of the first things we looked at was the conceived benefit of growth. These charts all represent different growth metrics, including weight for age, height for age, weight for height, and BMI for age across the first three years of life. And the line colors represent the average growth Z-score for three groups, namely those who never use acid suppression in blue, uh, occasionally used in yellow and persistent, persistently used in red. And what our data showed was that across all of these growth measures, there was no significant difference in Z-scores depending on acid suppression use. We also looked at, on the individual level, how many non-users versus persistent users showed improvement in growth. And this chart shows the proportion of those with increased growth score changes with non-users as the left bar uh, in blue and persistent users as a right bar in red within each pair. What we found was that, as you may expect, not everyone improves, but that for each growth metric, there is no significant difference in the proportion of those who improve between non-users and persistent users. Moving on to lung disease, a conceived risk of acid suppression. These figures show that proportionately more persistent users had a worsening Seefeld score for from age one to three years. Um, please note that these are not looking at discrete points in time, but comparing changes in lung disease. So on the left, you'll see that at one year of age, the persistent users have greater severity of lung disease at baseline. But when you look at their lung disease severity at three years, in that interval, they become more worse compared to non-users as evidenced by the steeper slope. What this means is that the persistent users declined significantly more in relation to their lung disease compared to the non-users. On the right, looking at the percentage of those who had worsened lung disease outcomes, there was also a significant difference in lung disease between non-users and persistent users between one and three years. This means that persistent users had a greater proportion of worsening lung disease outcomes from one to three years. All that being said, uh, there are multiple factors that contribute to lung disease, and it's not clear that acid suppression can directly lead to worse outcomes. But our data showed that persistent users had a greater change or became more worse from age one to three years. Um, now moving on to the gut microbiome, there are again environmental things like diet or stress that can contribute. Um, but when we looked within our cohort at the gut microbiomes of those who are persistent versus non-users of acid suppression, we found significant differences. Um, this graph shows difference in the number of species found in stool samples at age one and three years. Our data showed that gut microbiome richness was significantly lower in persistent users in red compared to non-users of acid suppression at three years of age. In addition to the number of species being significantly different or decreased in those with persistent acid suppression, gut microbiome alpha diversity, which takes into account not only the species number, but the relative abundance of the species, was significantly lower 
in persistent users compared to non-users of asset suppression at three years of age. So with all this in mind, we can go back to our question, do the benefits of asset suppression outweigh the risks? And we don't have the complete answers yet, but in our study, we addressed both sides and looking at associations between acid suppression and growth, lung disease, and the gut microbiome. Uh, to conclude, our data ultimately showed that in the first cohort, acid suppression often starts early in infancy and is used more in pancreatic insufficient children. Early and persistent acid suppression in young children with CF was not associated with any growth benefit. And prolonged acid suppression is actually associated with reduced gut microbiome diversity and negative impacts on early onset lung disease. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank uh, the first study group investigators and all the families, um, the CF centers in Salt Lake City, Madison, um, Milwaukee, Chicago, Indianapolis, and Boston, um, Dr. Farrell and Dr. Lai for their endless guidance with this project, um, and Dr. Ann Monk. Uh, also, a huge shout out to Katie McDonald, who took all of these pictures or most of these pictures. This is probably my favorite slide, so <laughs> thank you. I think we have time for a few questions, if anybody has any. I can also read some from the app that we have. Sure. If anybody wants to line up for um, So let's see. Can you discuss if use of PPI slash H2 blockers affected frequency of symptoms of fat malabsorption and whether this was looked at? Um, went on to say, I find that patients, even if growth is not impacted, might report that they experience less symptoms of fat malabsorption with use of an acid suppressor. Yeah, so for our study, we didn't really separate it based on whether they were on H2 blockers or PPIs. Um, so I, I don't really have the data or knowledge to answer that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, thank you. No worries. Um, and then it says, um, another question was, did you look at the genetics and or disease severity of persistent users with higher incidence of lung disease? We did not, but that is an interesting question that I think we can investigate in the future. Um, hi, I have a question. I'm sure Joan Jamana from Cohen Children's in New York. Um, my, my question is, um, did you do any um, kind of endoscopic workup or did the did the kids with the persistent use, did it prompt you to say, hey, you know, let's do an endoscopy at six months that, that they've been on it or? Um, to my knowledge, there were no endoscopic evaluations. I think, um, are you referencing like the the gut microbiome or the... You know, in general, with so we, where we, where we are, we, um, we put kids on, you know, the first line, then the PPI, and then mm -hmm. after a certain period of time, we try to take them off. Right. And if symptoms recur, then we have a low threshold to, to kind of evaluate the gut. Um, so just, just curious if that was something that you guys were thinking about in terms of, you know... Yeah, that but, sounds like you would definitively diagnose GERD, right, you know, right, better, right, and then right. you would put uh, these children on PPIs or acid blockers right. for a reason. Right. Um, a lot of the times we don't, you know, scope a lot of children because, right. you no, know, I, so yeah. um, Risk benefit. I, yeah. I, I think for that, it's, it's kind of more of a muddled question in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks. Great presentation. Thank you. Tom Ziegler from Emory University. Really nice talk and very important study. I know you don't you don't have any data on this now, but PPIs have been linked to uh, malabsorption of both copper and B12, and so I don't know if that's um, something that potentially could be looked at in your cohort. Yeah, so I'm not sure if we have the data on that either, but um, I do know that. Um, malabsorption spans not only B12 and iron, which I listed, but also copper and other nutrients. Um, that would be an interesting question that we could also look at. 
Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Matea Shore. She's a third year undergraduate student at the Emory College of Arts and Science. And today she's gonna present on dietary fat intake is associated with increased bone mineral density and lean mass in adults with cystic fibrosis. So, thank you. Hello everyone, um, thank you to the moderators for the introduction and the foundation for the invitation to be here. Hang on, I think I was all creative getting the mouse over there and now I can't go forward. There we go. Um, I don't have anything to disclose, I'm only 20, so not yet. <laughs> So the general recommendation for those with cystic fibrosis has been to consume a high calorie, high fat diet. Um, and this is as a result of malnutrition and nutrient absorption issues that people with CF often uh, experience. Unfortunately though, this has translated into people with cystic fibrosis consuming low nutrient dense diets, especially in the Western world with fast food so readily available. Um, research from our lab has shown that lower diet quality scores in adults with CF compared to not, uh, match non-CF controls, uh, despite no notable difference in macronutrient consumption. Um, this can be seen in this graph in the lower right corner, um, in which you see the 2015 healthy eating index scores were significantly lower in those with cystic fibrosis than in the control groups. Um, in the general population, there's also a lot of consideration into pro-inflammatory effects of fatty acids, such as saturated fatty acids and trans fatty acids, versus those that are health-promoting or known as those healthy fats, like monounsaturated fatty acids. Um, this is driven by connections between trans fatty acids and saturated fatty acids and cardiovascular disease. Um, so I'm going to start with the two graphs on the left. Um, and our lab found that saturated fats and trans fats uh, consumption were higher in those with cystic fibrosis than the controls. And then we also recently published findings of positive relationships between dietary mono and polyunsaturated fatty acid intake levels and insulin secretion as measured by C-peptide levels and as seen in the right two graphs. With increased lifespan and subsequent appearance of adult metabolic diseases, investigation into dietary fatty acid quality in people with cystic fibrosis is lacking, but very needed. 
Um, so this is, our lab uh, have recently been focusing on linoleic acid in a general population, so people without CF. Um, this is an essential fatty acid, but it's hypothesized to serve as a precursor for pro-inflammatory molecules like arachidonic acid. Um, previous results from our lab found that overall, dietary omega-6 fatty acids were inversely associated with total bone mineral density, again, in that non-CF population. Um, so using untargeted metabolomics, we also found a positive relationship between plasma linoleic acid and adiposity, um, as seen in the top graph, and an inverse relationship with bone mineral density, as seen in the bottom graph. So the objective of this study was to assess the relationship between dietary fatty acids and indexes of body composition in adults with cystic fibrosis. Um, based on our previous finding in people without cystic fibrosis, we hypothesized that greater intake of pro-inflammatory fatty acids is associated with higher adiposity and lower bone mineral density in people with CF. Uh, this was a cross-sectional study of 25 adults with cystic fibrosis. The participants in data came from the parent study BEAM, which also had 25 healthy controls. However, for this study, we only focused on people with cystic fibrosis. Recruitment was conducted from October 2014 to November 2018 from the Emory University Cystic Fibrosis Clinical Care Center. The inclusion-exclusion criteria consisted of um, having a confirmed CF diagnosis with at least one class one to three CFTR mutations. You had to be older than 18 years old. You had to be on a clinically stable medical regimen for three weeks and have had no IV or oral antibiotics for at least three weeks. Um, exclusion criteria consisted of current pregnancy, unwilling or unable to di discontinue enteral tube feeds for one night before the study visit, um, if applicable, and the most recent FEV 1% was less than 40%. Dietary intake was collected via three-day food records. Uh, these food records included two weekdays and one weekend day. They were analyzed using nutrition data system for research, NDSR. Um, and we were focusing on those fatty acids, including omega-3 and 6 fatty acids. Um, and dietary intake variables were adjusted per 1,000 calories. We collected the body composition data via um, DEXA, and we collected the muscle strength um, by hand grip dynamometry. So how we analyze. So variable distributions were evaluated for normality. Um, if not normal, the variables were log 10 transformed. We then uh, looked at the relationships between dietary intake and body composition parameters via Spearman correlations. Uh, we then conducted multiple linear regression analyses adjusting for age and gender, and these statistical analyses were conducted on JUMP. Uh, the demographic data that arose, so the mean age of our CF participants was about 29 years old. 88% were white, 56% were female. About half were delta F508 homozygous. The mean FEV1% was about 74%. All were pancreatic insufficient, and about 44% had CF-related diabetes. So the next few slides um, are going to look a little similar. We're going to go back and forth between tables and graphs. Um, but on the tables along the left, you'll see the body composition, or sorry, you'll see the uh, dietary intake variables. And along the top, you'll see the body composition variables. Um, in the tables, Spearman correlation results are shown. So in this slide, um, you see macronutrients along the left and all seven of the body composition variables analyzed along the top. Positive associations are seen in green, and negative associations are seen in red. Um, for the macronutrients, we found that total calories, protein, and fat were positively associated with bone, mineral density, lean mass, and strength measurements, while total calories and carbohydrates were negatively associated with adiposity measurements. The same relationships were then analyzed via linear regression analyses to adjust for age and gender. Um, we found that positive independent relationships between dietary fat and bone density, those are the top two graphs, and between protein intake and lean mass, the top right graph. And then we found an inverse relationship between carbohydrate intake and bone density. 
We then dug deeper into the specific fatty acids. Uh, shown here are the fatty acids and the bone and strength measurements. And we found total uh, monounsaturated fatty acids and total saturated fatty acids were positively associated with higher bone mineral density and strength measurements. After adjustment for age and sex, both monounsaturated fatty acids and saturated fatty acids had positive associations that remained significantly associated with both total bone mineral density and spine bone mineral density. Of the omega-3 and 6 acids analyzed, arachidonic acid was positively associated with bone density and lean mass, while linoleic acid and the other omega-3 and 6 essential fatty acids were not associated with our body composition variables. This relationship with arachidonic acid and bone mineral density remained after adjusting for age and sex. But when we analyzed the specific fatty acids and adiposity measurements, um, none were significantly associated with adiposity. Additionally, none of the omega-3 or 6 fatty acids were significantly associated with the adiposity measurements. So to conclude, uh, total dietary fat intake was associated with higher bone mineral density and lean mass. Source of dietary fats, um, the specific fatty acids consumed, did not differ in their relationships with body composition. Relationships were likely driven by total fat intake. Um, this data supports current recommendations for increased fat intake for maintenance of bone and muscle in adults with cystic fibrosis. The strengths, limitations, and future directions of the study. Um, so DEXA is the clinical gold standard for body composition assessment. Um, some of the limitations included reliance on self-reported dietary intake um, for accuracy and detail. Um, it was a small sample size, and the data was collected before the highly effective modulator therapy era. Uh, future directions include a larger sample size, as well as assessment of plasma fatty acids. I want to thank the Cystic Fibrosis Fund Foundation and the National Institute of Health for the funding, my lead mentor, Jessica Alvarez, and a special thank you to the study participants. We do have time for questions, so if anyone has any questions for Matea. While I'm looking on the app, I did have a question. Um, so would you say that people with CF don't need to worry about which fats they consume? So um, that's an awesome question. So the we always are going to say to consider what you're eating, and we're always trying to push um, people with CF towards a healthier diet. Um, a big thing to consider is that this data was collected before the highly effective modulator therapy. So um, it's possible that these trends may have changed um, now, and it's always better to be moving towards a healthier diet. Thank you. Um, and then one question I did find on the app was, was dietary intake of total fat relationship with bone mineral density controlled for BMI or weight? No, it was not. And then another question I had was, do you have an explanation for why carbohydrates had an inverse relationship and fat had a direct relationship? Yeah, I'm going to just go back to the slide so I can show those um, graphs. So here you see um, the top le two left, um, that total fat has a positive relationship with bone mineral density, and yet carbs has an inverse. Um, so when we saw this, we actually did a linear regression model between the two, and we found that carbohydrates, uh, total carbohydrate intake and total fat intake were inversely related. So um, when the participant was consuming or, you know, as one increased, the other decreased, and that's likely why their relationships were opposite. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question from the app was, was the DEXA hip spine, was it, oh, sorry, was it hip or spine or full body? So we had both total um, and spine bone mineral density, but it was a total DEXA scan. Yeah. Let me just check one more time. Sorry, we've had a lot of... Yeah. Okay, found another one. Not really a question, but it might also be interesting to look at lipid profiles 
when talking about intake of different types of fats? So 100%. Okay. Um, you know, this is an ongoing study and we have a lot of other things that we're going to look at. So that's um, an awesome suggestion to add to the collection. Yeah, we'll be out on the lookout. For yeah. Sure. I think that's it. Um, right. I just, I can't remember if you said, did you look at physical activity and like um, weight bearing activity on bone mineral, mineral density and the relationship to that? We, we have that data. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of the conference.